Welcome back to chapter 12. In this third video, we're going to be looking at pedigrees and non-traditional inheritance patterns. So what are pedigrees? A pedigree, like the one shown here, is a chart that shows the inheritance of a trait or health condition through different generations of a family. The pedigree can show you the relationships among or between the family members and tells you which individuals have a certain trait of interest. So there are a few rules to know. For instance, males are usually depicted using a square. So if I see something like this on the left, that's a male. If it's shaded in, that tells you that individual is affected. So this one is a circle, that is a female, and that happens to be an affected female. That's showing the particular trait of interest. If you do not know the sex of the child, we use a diamond. And if someone is deceased, it's not shown in this pedigree, but we would put a slash through that person. Anyone who is not affected, who does not have that trait of interest, is not shaded in. If you want to see who is mating, so those lines connect two mates together. So someone who is mating with another person, a couple, looks like they're that. They're connected between the circle and the square. But if you see the line coming from the top of the circle or square or the unknown sex, then that is a child of the previous generation of that previous couple. And if you ever see lines like this, that indicates twins. And in this case, it looks like they are probably monozygotic twins. They came from one zygote. I think these look like identical twins. Let's look at the pedigree for a genetic disorder known as alcaptonuria. So this is a disorder where two of our amino acids, phenylalanine and tyrosine, cannot be properly metabolized. So individuals with alcaptonuria uh, might have darker skin, they might have brown urine, and they might have joint pain or joint damage in addition to several other symptoms. So with this pedigree, there's a key at the bottom to remind me that the square is male, circles are females, and blue individuals are those with the trait. So if we look through the pedigree, notice that you can often tell the genotype or what the genotype of a person might be just based on the pedigree, even if they do not give you the genotype, such as this person here. If I look at these kids, their offspring, the offspring of the first generation, I can tell that this person is affected because of this key right here. And it looks like alcaptonuria is a recessive disorder because people with two recessive alleles are all affected. To be normal, to not have the trait or be unaffected, I know you have to have at least one big A to be unaffected. So all of these individuals that are in yellow for this pedigree must have at least one big A. Let's try a practice problem that's posed by our textbook. Our book asks us, what are the genotypes of the individuals labeled one, two, and three? And I just wanted to make a quick note that the pedigree in the previous slide and in the PDF that you might have printed out or saved to your computer um, is incorrect. That was a previous edition of the book. The newest edition is corrected. So this pedigree is the correct one. But let's look at the individuals. Person one, person one is blue, a male that's affected with a trait, with alcaptonuria. I know from the previous slide, I said this was a recessive disorder, so they must be small a, small a. Person number two, since this is a recessive disorder and they are unaffected, this female must have at least one big A. And right now I don't know what her second allele is yet, but if I look at her, their child, I know the child inherits one allele from each parent. So they got a small A from dad and they must have received a small A from mom as well. So she must be heterozygous. For the next person, person three, 
This is a yellow square, so an unaffected male. I know he has at least one big A. What is his second allele? Again, I look at their, ch uh, their child. This time their daughter is affected. Small A must have been received from the mom. So the other small A must have come from dad. So he is also a carrier. All right, big A, small A. And then if I had to look at this one, it's not part of the question, but I see a question mark here. So what is that one? That child is not affected, and we don't know what the second allele is. We could do a Punnett square and have probabilities of what that second allele might be. And let's see, big A, small A, small A, small A. I know that child's not affected. So small A, small A is out of the question. This child has a two thirds chance of being a carrier and a one third chance of being big A, big A. So these are the probabilities for this individual. Let's try another example. Again, they give us a little key so we can be reminded who a male or female are and the shaded in individuals. These are people with the trait. Remember if the line connects the two shapes that these are mates and offspring, the lines go or are connected to the top of the square or the circle. Birth order is shown where this is the oldest sibling on the left, the youngest will be on the right. So the question from this book is, is a widow's peak? Widow's peak is, if you look at your hairline, that little indentation right there versus a straight hairline. Is it dominant or recessive? So if I look at the pedigree, everyone who's shaded in has the widow's peak. So it looks like widow's peak must be dominant because the unaffected individuals are all recessive. They're homozygous recessive. Now let's see if we can create a pedigree based on information we're given. So a man without a widow's peak and I remember Widow's Peak from the previous slide, that was a dominant trait. So no Widow's Peak would be small w, small w. And this is a man, marries a woman who is heterozygous for the trait. So she must have a Widow's Peak because earlier we said this was a dominant trait. They have three children. So I'm gonna draw three lines here. Those are their kids. The oldest daughter has the trait circle. She's a daughter. She must have a big W. She must have a small W. I know she got the big W from mom and she has to get an allele from dad as well. And he only has small Ws to give. So that's why I know she was heterozygous. Their second son is a, or sorry, second child is a son without the trait. So this is small W, small W. He must have gotten one of each from either parent. So one small W from mom, the other small W from dad. Their youngest is a girl who is also without the trait. Also small W, small W. Now let's put things together. Remember that probability rules can be used together with pedigrees to make genetic inferences. So in part B, we have a question that says, what is the chance that their fourth child will be a boy with a trait. So they have three kids already. What's the chance that the fourth child will be, I should say male. So that's half a chance to be male. And so whenever I have and, remember we're gonna multiply. So what's the chance of having the trait? Remember the trait is widow's peak. So if these are the parents, I could do a Punnett square, big W, small w's on this side, heterozygous mom and a homozygous recessive dad. That would be big, small, 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 uh, big, small. So half a chance of having the trait and half a chance of being a boy. That's one half times one half that we're going to have a fourth, <coughs> excuse me, fourth child that is a boy with a trait. So that is a total of a one-fourth chance. So far we've been looking at single characteristics with two different versions, such as widow's peak. We could have a widow's peak or a straight hairline or seed color. We could have yellow or green. 
Now we're going to look at two characteristics at the same time, where each characteristic has two versions or two traits. So one example is something we encounter called the dihybrid cross. And how we get there, we're always going to start with the parental generation. And for our class, we're always going to have true breeding parents. They're always going to be homozygous for their trait. So here I have two true breeding parents. The one on the left is a yellow round seed. You can see it's homozygous dominant for both, both characteristics. <clears throat> Excuse me. The one on the right is a green wrinkled seed. Again, true breeding for both characteristics. If we look at their offspring, the F1 generation, you can see that the offspring has to get an allele from each parent for each of the characteristics. So if we just look at Y, it gets big Y, if I assume this is mom and this is dad, it gets big Y from mom, small y from dad. And then if I look at the seed type, if it's round or wrinkled, it gets big R from mom, small r from dad. And remember, you get a single allele for each of the characteristics because of meiosis. In the gametes, there are only um, one of each. They're haploid gametes. So now I have my F1 generation, and I'm going to do a self-cross. This is a dihybrid cross because you're heterozygous or hybrid for both characteristics. When I do or perform a dihybrid cross, you will always get under normal dominant recessive um, patterns, inheritance patterns, you're always going to get a 9331 phenotypic ratio. So for these, we don't usually do genotypic ratios. They get really complicated. But the phenotypic ratio is going to be 9331. So if you ever get F2 data and you see this ratio, you can automatically think, oh, the parents of this F2 generation were dihybrids. And if I look at the ratio more closely, 9 will always exhibit the phenotype that was dominant for both. So this is yellow and round. Three of them will be dominant for one and recessive for the other. So here it's recessive for color, but dominant for round. The other three will be the opposite. So this one's dominant for the color, but recessive for the shape. And the last one is recessive for both in terms of phenotype. It's green and it's wrinkled. Let's take a closer look at the Punnett square and how we derived the gametes for that Punnett square. So if I look at my dihybrid organism, it's a diploid organism. It has two of each type of allele. And I know after meiosis, I'm going to have haploid gametes. For the gametes, the most common mistake I see from students is they include one characteristic, but they forget the other. It's like having a kid with lots of hair, but no eyes or vice versa. For the seed here, it would be the example of the error would be having two Y's, but no R's or having two R's, but no Y. So you have to consider both color and shape of the seed in this case. Also, remember we had independent assortment or independent segregation during meiosis. And this is after the homologous chromosomes line up in metaphase one, they're pulled apart and they line up independently of each other. Each homologous chromosome will line up independently of the next set of homologous chromosomes. So when we have the separation, we have, for example, here we have big Y, big R, or we can get small Y, big R, or we can have big Y, small r for that one, or small y, small r, as we see there. And since this was an F1 or dihybrid cross, the other gametes are the same. And when we put them back together, we see we regenerate the diploid organism. And by convention, we always have the capital letters to the left of the lowercase letters. If you look carefully at each trait, sorry, each characteristic, you can still see the three to one ratio that we saw for the monohybrid cross. If I only look at the Ys, for example, big Y, 
big Y. That's 9 plus 3, or 12. 12 big Y. 2, what is that, 3 plus 1, to 4 small Y. And that simplifies to a 3 to 1 ratio for the color of the seed. And if I look at shape, I can see the same thing is true. 12 of them are round. Oops, sorry, that should say 12 are, 12 round. And four of them are wrinkled. And that also simplifies to that 3 to 1 ratio. This is another Punnett square showing the F2 generation of a different dihybrid cross using two different characteristics. In this case, big T is tall, small t is dwarf, and big I is inflated and small i is constricted. And just that one is a little bit hard to tell what they mean. But if you're looking at the seed pod, this is what inflated looks like versus constricted. But as you see, the gametes are similar to what we saw for the color and shape of the seed in the previous slide. We have big T with big I, big T with small I, or small T with big I, small T with small I, and you have both characteristics for each of these gametes. The same is true here, and we will see our typical 9331 ratio if you look through the F2 generation. Now that we have a sense of typical inheritance patterns, let's look at a few cases where dominance is different. The first one here is incomplete dominance. And we see this in, for example, snapdragons, where if we cross a true breeding red flower with a true breeding white flower, which is recessive, then we get heterozygotes, heterozygotes that are not red. Rather, they are pink because having only one copy of the big A allele is not enough to generate the red color. It only partially generates some red, which appears as pink. So if that happens and then you cross the F1 through a monohybrid cross, you can generate a pennant square for that. What you're gonna end up with is one big A, big A, which turns out to be a red flower, two big A small A's, which turn out to be pink, and one small A small A, which turn out to be white. But we don't usually use this these symbols when we're getting, we're talking about incomplete dominance, just to differentiate it from typical dominance patterns. Instead, what you usually see is something like this. Uh, you can choose a letter depicting color, for example, C for color, and you could have capital R for red, this would be homozygous for red, or you could have something like capital C with R and then W for white. So this would be a pink flower. And then the other one, I'm gonna draw, draw it down here. That would be a white flower right there. Here it is again, written more clearly. So we have our red parent, homozygous dominant. We have our white parent, homozygous recessive, but it's capital because we're exhibiting incomplete dominance. So we write it in a different format. Our hybrid organism has one of each allele. And again, if you generate a Punnett square, you get that one to two to one genotypic ratio. And this time it's also a one to two to one phenotypic ratio because of the incomplete dominance. Our next non-traditional pattern of inheritance is multiple alleles for a single trait. Before this, we've only been looking at two alleles for each trait. For example, big W, small w, or yellow seed, green seed. But we can have more than two, and that's the case for many of our different genes. Our book gives an example of rabbit coat color, where there are four different types of alleles you can get, and they have a certain order for their dominance. So in this case, the wild type, the most common phenotype is brown fur, and they're using the big C allele. That's dominant to the CCH allele. It's like a superscript CH, which is chinchilla. And that is dominant to CH, which is Himalayan. And that's dominant to just small c, which is albino. Another example for multiple alleles, which I think is more common, is our human blood groups. If you know your blood type, this might look familiar. If you might be type A, type AB, type B, or type O blood. We usually use the symbol I, and I stands for iso, 
agglutinogen. It's a type of antigen on the surface of our red blood cells that identifies our blood type. And we use superscripts, just like we saw before. So we have I superscript B, sorry, superscript A here, I superscript B here, and small i. These are co-dominant. They're both equally dominant, and they're both dominant to the recessive small i. If you have the I superscript A allele, this means you have an A carbohydrate on the surface of your red blood cells. If you have this allele, then you have the B carbohydrate on the surface of your red blood cells. And if you have this allele, that encodes neither of the two carbohydrates. Looking at these alleles and the type of carbohydrate you'd have on the surface of your red blood cell, we can see that if you have this genotype, where your homozygous dominant for A, or you have A and I, then you have type A blood. This is your phenotype, and so forth. You can see the same thing is true for Bs. If you have both, they're co-dominant to each other. They're equally dominant. So you have both types of carbohydrates on the surface for type AB blood. And if you get a small I allele from both parents, then you have type O blood. That takes us to the end of the third video. In our fourth and final video, we'll wrap up the chapter by looking at how most genes have multiple phenotypic effects. We're going to look at sex-linked genes and also epistasis.